Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. It seems as if a crime wave has crashed over America. The public is looking for answers. Scholars are arguing. Is the solution punishment or prevention or both? Joining us to sort through the conflict and the consensus are Professor Lonnie Guineer of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, former Justice Department official and author of the newly published The Tyranny of the Majority. Judge Robert Bork of the American Enterprise Institute, former Solicitor General and author of the best-selling book, The Tempting of America. Professor Philip Hyman on leave as director of Harvard's Center for Criminal Justice. Professor Hyman recently resigned as President Clinton's Deputy Attorney General. And Professor John DiGiulio of Princeton University and the Brookings Institution, author of No Escape, The Future of American Corrections. The first question before this house is, does punishment pay? This week on Think Tank. Americans are frightened about crime, and why not? Crime is up, way up. The violent crime rate rose nearly fivefold in the last 40 years. And violent criminals serve only about a third of their sentences, and while on parole, one in three commit new crimes. This rising tide of crime led President Bush's Attorney General, William Barr, to issue a controversial report entitled, The Case for More Incarceration. According to Barr, the simple fact is that the best way to stop crime is to put criminals in prison. In other words, a thug in jail can't shoot your sister. Hardliners say such incapacitation works, and today there are more than a million criminals in prison, far more than ever before. As the prisons fill, the violent crime rate does seem to be leveling off. And the large majority of the offenders locked up are dangerous. Our panelist John DiGiulio stresses that 93% of state prisoners are either violent or repeat offenders. Now, critics challenge some of this data and point out that prisons are expensive, they are overcrowded, they are disproportionately populated by African Americans, and they are doing a terrible job at rehabilitation. Further, the critics say we are filling prisons with minor drug offenders, not the really bad guys, that more punishment has not reduced crime, and that we ought to stress prevention. What happened? The hardliners say we got soft on crime. According to one study, as the chances went down that a criminal would be caught, convicted, and spend time in jail, the rate of serious crimes soared. Punishment down, crime up. We will come to prevention later, but our opening question is this. If we put more criminals in jail for longer sentences, will American streets be safer? Phil Hyman, how about that? Ben, it's not a surprise that it depends on who you put in jail. If you want safe streets, you've got to identify violent people, and we have to lock up violent people as long as they're violent or likely to be violent. We also have to stop growing them, so the answer is, both prison and prevention. John Dulio, does, does punishment pay? Does it work? Well, I think you know, if, the quest, if, the, if, if prison is not the answer, what is the question? If the question is, how do we solve America's social ills, then prison is not the answer. But if the question is, how do we handle, how can we best handle violent and repeat criminals, then I think prison is far more of an answer than many of the critics of incarceration suppose. Just one statistic. We know from prisoner self-report surveys that the typical prisoner in the year prior to incarceration commits a dozen serious crimes a year, excluding all drug crimes. I think there's some social benefit to locking those people up. So, so that every additional year you keep them in prison is, uh, in theory at least, another 12 crimes that have not happened. Up to a point. Uh, the, the real difficulty gets, uh, is the question of at what point are we holding large populations of geriatric prisoners who no longer pose a threat. All right, Bob Bork, uh, one of our charts uh, showed or intimated that uh, crime has gone up because the society 
uh, has become too lax in punishing them. This is, gets back, I guess, to the whole Warren Court uh, argument. Uh, do you agree? Is that the principal cause of, uh, of violent crime in America? Well, I think it's one of the causes, but I would suppose another cause is the way we have handled social welfare programs. So we have these enormous illegitimacy rates and people being raised by one probably incompetent parent. And you see violent crime rising with those developments. Uh, that, is a that goes to prevention, of course. But well, I think that's important. Lonnie Guarnier, you, you saw that chart. Uh, the, uh, the rate of punishment, number of days in jail went down. Uh, at the same time, the crime rate went up. It, is, do you accept the idea that that is a cause and effect relationship? I don't find that particular chart helpful to me in explaining why I feel more scared living in my house today than I did five years ago. My concern with a focus on punishment is not to disagree with what other people have said. I agree that violent criminals should be imprisoned. I don't want them roaming the streets any more than anyone else does. My concern is that punishment seems to assume that those people that we're punishing or those people that we believe will not commit crimes for fear of being punished actually have an investment in the society that they're afraid to lose. And that's the part I'd like to focus on. That they is, have an investment in what sense? That you have um, a lot of young kids, a lot of um, young men who are committing crimes recklessly or perhaps rationally and we are assuming that if we simply have a threat of incarceration, that that will act as a deterrent to their behavior. And I'm not convinced that that is, in fact, well, true. Well, the point being made, I think, is that deterrent or not, if they're in prison, they are not committing violent crimes. Well, L Lonnie, Lonnie said a moment ago that she does not feel as safe now as she did five years ago. Does anybody, I mean, let, let's just take us. I do not feel as safe in my house as five years ago or ten years ago. Do you feel as no, safe? No, I certainly don't. Do you feel as safe? I do. You do feel as safe. <laughs> I'm going to come back well, we to got, you. That's I, because he looks at all the statistics. I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm like John. I, I look at the statistics. What's, what's happening is, yeah, there's been a great increase in crime and in imprisonment rates, both since 1985 or 86. But overall, there isn't a great change in the violence rate in the United States. What we've got... S since when? Oh, if you went back to 1973, 74. Right, but but, but we, we had a huge crime increase and then sort of a wobbly plateau. So it, it is, I, don't, I think we agree, it is at unacceptable also, levels. May, maybe 20 years ago we had it a huge... Does it also depend on where you live? That's, well, that's, 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 the, point. that's the point. Yeah, that, it, it I mean, our... our well-to-do uh, distinguished citizens or medium well-to-do or people not living in the inner cities, are, are they at greater risk today? I mean, that's what's driving the politics of this thing. Are they, in fact, at greater risk? They are not. Uh, two things are true here. Number one, if, you, if your baseline is 1960 even, then we've had a dramatic increase in violent crime because you have this increase in the 1960s and by the time you get to the mid-70s, it's up there and then it sort of levels off, okay, nationally. Right. So it depends what our baseline is. Secondly, Virtually all of the increase in violent crime has occurred in inner city neighborhoods, especially among juveniles living in inner city neighborhoods. The probability that someone living in a midi middle class or affluent suburb is going to be victimized, murdered, raped, robbed, assaulted, and so on, is less today than it was 20 years ago. Now, it's higher today than it was 40 years ago, okay? So lots of different it, things it, are going it, on here. It's lower in the suburbs than it used to be? That's right. Why, why, why is everybody uh, all, all of a sudden gone crazy about can this I, thing? What, can, what can is, I, uh, I mean, you, you had the Congress, the Senate pass this bill with $22 billion like it was a roller coaster. Crime has vaulted to be the number one issue in America. What's going on, Phil? We do have a burst of youth crime. 18-year-olds uh, are committing twice as many homicides per 100,000, per whatever number right. of them, as they were in 1986. In, in the, the latest figures. Uh, robberies are also up, and that's frightening. But it's not in the, it's not in the suburbs, it's in the central cities. That's correct. Right. But I think that the part of the reason it's so frightening to people is that they see that it's now in the central cities, but they don't have any assurance that's right. that that's where it's going to stay. The, uh, w one of the proposals that has achieved a great deal of prominence about what to do about this is the so-called three strikes and you're out idea. Do you like that? 
Well, I, I, think I know your answer. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, there's two questions. One is, does it make any sense for the states? Right. And there, I think it plainly doesn't make any sense for anybody because you're going to catch an armed robber who gets convicted for the third time at the age of 25. And the question is, do you want to hold him just to be uh, extreme? Do you want to hold him in his 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s? That will cost between six hundred and eight hundred thousand dollars please take my word for it it costs between twenty and thirty thousand dollars a year the answer is no i mean any sensible person would answer no you don't want to hold an armed robber who's been convicted three times and is twenty five in his 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And certainly not pay for yeah, his health care. Yeah, why pay for his health Do you agree with that? Oh, entirely, because... You, you, you have a problem with three strikes and out. Yeah, because I don't know why you give him three strikes in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that, that also is... John, John do you, you, know, you I, like three strikes and you're out? I, I love it. And I'll you tell do. You, and I'll tell you why. Um, and I, I appreciate exactly what Phil said, and he's, he's, he's right in what he said. But I look at a few other things as well. Number one, you have people, again, the, uh, pers the average prisoner, the typical prisoner, commits a dozen serious crimes a year, excluding all drug crimes, excluding right. all drug crimes. Secondly, the typical prisoner, in especially in large jurisdictions, has nine pr previous arrests and as many as six previous convictions. So they're committing lots of crimes that aren't detected and aren't punished. Third, I understand that once a criminal reaches his 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80, he's unlikely, 90s, long, unlikely, to, gone unli up, right. unlikely to commit predatory street crime. But I would ask the question, and there's a moral dimension to this as well, which is, does anyone think we ought not to incarcerate the 70, for life, the 73-year-old murderer of civil rights worker Medgar Evers? I think we ought to incarcerate that person for life. The community has a moral writ, not only to protect itself, but to do justice. I, I happen to think the three strikes and you're out thing is a, is a silly concept. The part that has been talked about that I think makes sense is to establish federal prisons to put violent state prisoners in jail at no cost to the states if the states change their penal codes so that parole for violent criminals will not average 35 percent but will go to 85 percent. That keeps the people off the street when they're in their crime prone years. Now do you agree with that part of, of, of this argument, the 85 percent parole? Who do we want to give discretion to? in terms of administering the criminal justice system. And do we want to take it away from the parole board? Do we want to take it away from judges who will not be able to um, impose sentences based on the particular circumstances of the individual but are obliged to impose mandatory minimum sentences? Do we want to give it to prosecutors, which is essentially what three strikes and you're out does. Yeah, you it gives it to the prosecutor. I don't trust the prosecutor any more than some people trust the judge or the parole board. I don't think that simply redistributing this enormous discretion to particular but, but actors think that without th monitoring but, what they're but doing is the answer. But do you think the that answer. the 35% level at which we let people out, 35% of their, of their sentence, uh, is that too low? If you want the guy to be in jail for 10 years, and if the state sets the sentence 10 to 30, then serving one-third of a 30-year sentence is what you wanted in the first place. Well, I don't think but, but, the parole um, operates in some ways as an incentive in certain circumstances for good behavior in prison, which then helps the prison authorities. I mean, I just, I guess, resist the notion that there are universal rules that we can, sitting in this room, come up with to determine who should be in a position to exercise this discretion without our worrying about but, it. But Ben, before you, you know, uh, I think it's easy to dismiss three strikes and you're out as silly, mm -hmm. but let's remember, right now, as we speak, for every person who's convicted of a crime and goes to prison, three people are put on the streets under probation and parole supervision. Let's also remember that literally millions of crimes are committed each year by community-based felons, people who are under so-called correctional supervision, where probation and parole agents have, on average, 10 minutes per case per week to supervise these people. Okay? And let's also remember that three strikes and you're out is another way of saying truth and sentencing. It's another way of saying truth and sentencing. Because if the states, the 30 states that are now considered... Well, so does that 85% provision provide that's right. for truth and, and I, sentencing. I, I would, right. I would, I'd be happy with either uh, of, the, of those things. Now, let, me, let me ask a, a, a political point. There's something 
there is a political inversion going on. The liberals who are supposed to be for more federal power and let's get in there and have the federal, ha have the feds establish these guidelines of how long you ought to serve, they're against this. The conservatives are saying, right on, let's have another great society federal type program that imposes carrots and sticks on the states. D d uh, I mean, you approve of this and oh, you yeah. do. And you do not like the federal government butting well, into I wouldn't things. say I don't like the federal <laughs> well, government. Well, I mean, you there. No, uh, listen, you're, uh, doc, doc, uh, Judge Bork is my colleague, and I have heard you, and you are uh, profoundly suspicious of any new I, federal programs, and yet you're for this one. Yeah. I think it's clear that we have to do something about incarceration rates. Uh, I think the public does not trust judges and the general apparatus that deals with criminal justice because they feel they're too liberal. All right. We, we have talked about punishment. Now let's take a look at uh, prevention. President Clinton recently uh, discussed the matter. We need to recognize that a lot of the kids that are getting in trouble have grown up in neighborhoods where there is no longer a strong sense of community, where their own families are not able to support them, and where there is not very much work. And when you have neighborhoods in which you lose family, community, and work, you're in a world of hurt. And we have to give those kids something to say yes to. There are indeed plenty of ideas about prevention. They include drug rehabilitation, 100,000 more police on the streets, gun control laws, less violence on television, boarding schools, boot camps, and community policing, a most interesting idea, so interesting that I recently joined some community-based policemen on a bicycle patrol. I, is this the uh, the wave of the future in policing doing this kind of stuff? I think so. Here and now it is. The, the, the benefit, you know, every every different department or every city has different concepts of what community-oriented policing should be. And our concept is is to spend half the time with the community and half the time in proactive enforcement. I, I ended up in that particular sequence uh, wearing a bulletproof vest, I'll have you know, and it, is, uh, it makes you kind of look like that, but you feel a lot safer. Anyway, uh, does community policing work? John. We don't know because it hasn't been tried in full anywhere in the country. And the reason it hasn't been tried is though it's a good idea and though there have been lots of nice experiments with it in places like New York and Los Angeles and Philadelphia and other jurisdictions, we don't have enough police officers to do it. And the truth of the matter is that community policing, which is a concept I strongly favor, uh, is a do more with more strategy. It's not a do more with less strategy. We are all talking uh, um, crime, crime, crime. Uh, but we know the, the black rates of, uh, uh, of criminal activity and of criminal victimhood are substantial, I don't know, five or six times higher than the, the white rates. When we talk crime, 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 are we really using code for black, black, black? To a great extent, yes, and I think that's a problem. Not because we shouldn't deal with the disproportionate number of crimes that young black men may be um, committing, but because if we can't talk about race, then when we talk about crime, we're really talking about other things, and it means that we're not being honest in terms of acknowledging what the problem is and then trying to deal with it. It's a way of distancing ourselves from the real problem, which is the tr terrible rise in um, urban violence. I think when we talk about crime, we are talking in code. I think we ought to stop talking in code and be explicit about it. Let me come back to one of your earlier questions, Ben, in this regard. Why have we had this shift uh, uh, in this debate on crime? I think if middle class and upper class neighborhoods were having the sort of crime problem that we're having in inner city neighborhoods, you wouldn't have the kinds of community-based corrections programs that we have. It's because these people are politically empower powerless and don't matter uh, that we have a criminal justice system that lets them be victimized repeatedly. It's, and it's the same reason why, for all the social programs that we've uh, put in place to address their problems, we have yet to make a serious national commitment in having a serious national urban strategy. So, so, so well, I'm not, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, when you look at the uh, people who object to uh, increasing punishment and so forth, they tend to be liberals, and indeed the, the black congressional caucus I objects to these things. So it's not that we are ignoring them, it's that some of their own representatives don't want these. Oh, Bob, I, I think we, uh, I, I agree with that, there's no question, I, but I think there is a disconnect there. Uh, the, what segment of the American population supports most strongly stern criminal justice measures? It is uh, socioeconomically deprived uh, blacks and Latinos living in inner city neighborhoods. Uh, it is, these are also people who have strongly support social programs. We need both. 
they're not getting either. So, so, so you say, I mean, we will talk about social programs in a, uh, in a moment, but you are saying that we ought to get even tougher on crime in the inner cities. Well, I, for example, one thing we might do, and I don't know that we don't, but it seems to me we should be assigning police based on the crime rate, not exactly. based on the population. Exactly. I don't think we do that. Exactly. I mean, I'm sure we don't. Uh, Bob Bork, let, let's just move on to, to one other item. Um, do you think these, uh, the Brady Bill, gun control, is going to be a uh, useful tool in preventing crime? No, I don't. I don't think it will at all. There are so many illegal guns out there now that the supply probably won't be contracted for years and years and years. Uh, probably what you'll do is wind up, uh, if you keep moving in the direction of the Brady Bill, wind up taking guns away from people who really want them for self-defense. Right. L Lonnie, what about the issue, let's just run through some of these, of uh, violence on television. Is, is, that, uh, is that driving some of this crime wave? Well, I don't think it's violence on television per se. I think that we have a very violent culture. I think even the way that we conduct some of our discourse is violent. Uh, Sheldon Hackney calls it drive-by debate. <laughs> I think that um, when you have a culture that believes that the way that you have a conversation is to have a fight, yes, that message gets um, communicated down to people who are growing up without a lot of uh, resources and without a lot of options and their responses um, I've heard John say before is radically self-interested and radically present um, oriented and that's uh, dangerous for them and it's dangerous for us. We've come to, to two <coughs> schools of thought about what to do about the, the social problem that drives lots of the other problems in the inner city. One school of thought says it's a result of perverse and unintended consequences of federal policies, welfare and so forth and so on. And the conservative response to that traditionally has been, so let's try to re-stigmatize illegitimate birth. Let's try to uh, basically recreate the conditions that gave us the stable family and the working class community. My view is that that's gone. It's never coming back. Forget about it. This leaves us with some sort of a public policy response. Where I depart from my more liberal friends and colleagues is, many of them seem to think that the answer is retreading great society programs, more head start. Uh, summer education and training programs. None of these programs have worked. You want to talk root causes? Let's talk root causes. Let's get truly radical. Okay, we, we are approaching the end of this uh, very interesting discussion. Let me ask you if you could uh, briefly tell us, we'll go around the room, what do we agree on and what do we disagree on? Lonnie. I think we agree that there's a crisis of confidence in the ability of our government decision makers to make the right decision without more accountability and more information. I don't trust the Congress or the President or this administration to do the right thing in a politically charged environment. I think what we disagree on is what the solution is and I would like to hear more stories about local experiences with combating crime and with um, encouraging our young people to invest in their future, encouraging us to invest in our young people rather than um, just punishing them. Bob Bork. I think we agree that incarceration at least reduces crime by taking dangerous criminals off the street during the years in which they commit crimes. I think we disagree about how one tries to prevent crimes in the future. I don't think there are any local programs out there that are working so well that we can go adopt them. I think in the long term, and, and it's very coercive to do some of the things we're talking about, in the long term, I think we have to adjust our social programs to get fathers back in the family and to stop illegitimacy. Phil Hyman. Well, I think we agree that we have to do both locking up of people who are dangerous while they're dangerous, not afterwards, and some kind of prevention to deal with that 10-year-old crowd that's coming along and the 5-year-old crowd after them. I certainly disagree with what Bob just said, and I think it's an, and I think it's an important disagreement. I think there are programs out there that, are wor that will work. We have to find those programs and we have to encourage them. I, is the Clinton administration on the right track? Clinton administration's heart is in the right place, but whether its politics will allow it to go where its brains and its heart tell it it should go, we'll have to see. John? I think we agree there are lots of violent and repeat criminals out there. We disagree about just how many there are and how we ought to handle them. I think we, we disagree somewhat about the capacity of government to intervene and solve these problems. I agree there are lots of good state and local programs out there. I'm very, very dubious about whether they can be replicated widely by national policy fiat.
I is the Clinton administration and the Congress moving in the right direction? I don't think the Clinton administration and the Congress know what direction they're moving in. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> <laughs> okay. On that note, thank you, uh, Professors uh, Grenier, DiGiulio, uh, Judge Bork, Professor Hyman, and thank you. Until next time, for Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.